Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our Key Investors Roundtable series. We are pleased to provide these webinars for our key investors and partners in the community. I am Wendy Hamilton, President and CEO of TechSmith, as well as the Chair for the Lansing Regional Chamber of Commerce Board. I'd like to thank the Chamber, also our Roundtable partner, LEAP, the event team, and President Stanley for their support. We all recognize the important role that MSU has in our region, and its role will be critical in re-engaging our economy. So we are very pleased to host President Samuel L. Stanley, Jr. It was just nine months ago in August of 2019 that President Stanley was selected as MSU's 21st president. Since his arrival, he's moved decisively to ensure the university is a safe, respectful, and welcoming place for all. In addition to his focus on student success and well being, he continues to grow MSU's extraordinary economic, scientific, and research impact globally and regionally. The university's research portfolio exceeded 715 million in 2018, which has had a significant regional impact. And he's committed to maintaining that regional impact. Uh, he has had previous significant contributions towards local economic development, both at Stony Brook and Washington University. And even more fortunate and timely for us, President Stanley is a medical doctor with a background in infectious disease. After receiving his medical degree from Harvard, he pursued his fellowship in infectious disease at Washington University School of Medicine serving in the Division of Infectious Diseases. He was a biomedical researcher and a published author in the area of immunity from infections. President Stanley also served as director of the NIH-funded MRC, the Midwest Regional Center of Excellence for Biodefense and Emerging Infectious Diseases Research. On a personal note, I feel that we as a region are incredibly fortunate to have someone with President Stanley's very relevant background at the helm right now, and I'm very much looking forward to his perspective today. A few housekeeping items before we begin the program. All participants' audio will be muted during the program. President Stanley will first share a few words, about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll shift to responding to questions. We will utilize the online Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Please submit your questions uh, through this uh, software feature at any time during the discussion, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. So President Stanley, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. You know, we first met at the grand opening of the Impression 5 uh, Children's Science Museum, a smash exhibit based on MSU's EFRIB uh, particle accelerator. We both had speeches. I, I went before you, and, and during my speech, I looked out at all the people and all the press, and I thought, gee, I better wrap this up because everyone's here to hear you, not me. <laughs> and I have that feeling, that deja vu feeling again. Uh, so please begin. Well, 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 not true, Wendy, and, and first of all, but, but thank you so much for that very generous introduction. It's great to be here with you uh, and with everyone today. Um, you know, I originally had some remarks prepared and I decided that I would go ahead and, and be a little more spontaneous. And uh, instead of telling you about some of the amazing things Michigan State University is doing, which of course, you know, I, I, I get paid to do, I guess, basically, um, I thought I'd give you a little more information on how we're responding basically to COVID-19, some of the financial uh, challenges we face from it, but also how we're considering reopening, which of course I think is, is important for the economy in the area. And I think that's what I look forward to in the question and answer period is answering maybe some of your questions about what we're contemplating in that realm, but also hearing some of your comments and suggestions about how we might reopen and how we might do the best we can in this by consulting the community and business leaders uh, in the decisions we're making. So um, as Wendy said, um, I have probably a, a somewhat unique perspective on this outbreak. And I think when it first uh, heard about it in China, I thought it would be very similar to previous coronaviruses outbreaks. So we've had two major coronavirus outbreaks before, and one was called SARS, as you know, um, also came uh, out of China, uh, was a very severe disease, about an eight to 10% mortality, um, but not as contagious. 
as COVID-19 was really, in fact, able to be contained essentially um, by the standard tools of public health. So that's case identification, quarantine, isolation. Um, that eventually enabled us to get down an epidemic, which was worldwide. It did spread to a number of countries through travel, got it under control, and were able to completely control it. And we haven't seen really a, a re return of SARS per se. And then um, about 10 years ago, a disease called MERS was recognized, Mideast Respiratory uh, Syndrome. Uh, and that virus is also a coronavirus, and that's even more deadly. So about a 34% mortality in individuals who get this. There have been several unique outbreaks, but mainly in Mideast, uh, regions and again controllable, not as contagious again as the COVID-19 virus, uh, able to contain through standard public health measures. So when this first came out in China, I thought the same would have probably applied, that through vigorous public health measures it could be contained in China or if it did spread there would be isolated outbreaks that again could eventually be controlled. Um, this turned out to be a very different virus as you know. Um, turns out to be much more contagious than the previous SARS virus, has this really unique uh, feature that I think of a large number of people being asymptomatic. So there's a large group of people who don't develop symptoms with this virus, who can be walking around either before they get symptoms or never get symptoms and shedding virus. And the highest shedding with this virus, unlike SARS and MERS, is not when people are sickest, but probably early on in infection when they're still relatively healthy. So that makes it particularly difficult to control and deal with. And then the other thing is just the wide range of severity, as, as you know. So for students, for example, students in the college age group, um, there's probably very few chances or relatively low chance of severe disease with infection. If enough students get infected, potentially you might see some cases that are more severe. But in general, that's not going to be the case. But for our faculty and staff, for example, we're 30 3% or so uh, are over the age of 55, um, there's higher risk for those individuals. And so we know the elderly, we know people with a number of different comorbidities are more likely to develop severe disease with this. And we know the terrible consequences we've seen from the outbreak just in the state of Michigan. As we look at the number of deaths, the devastating impact, particularly on underrepresented minority communities, particularly in the Detroit area and Flint and other areas um, where we've seen disproportionate mortality from this disease. Um, we know what a tremendous impact it's had, but it's not attacking everybody the same way. And that again makes it harder to deal with and control from a number of perspectives. So it's been a challenge. At, at Michigan State University, we made the decision when the first cases were reported in the state of Michigan to go ahead and move completely to online teaching. So we basically told students and faculty and staff, we won't be teaching in classes anymore. We're going to ask faculty and staff to prepare all their lessons remotely via online or simply giving the lectures um, from their own office, for example, remotely to students. But we were going to end face-to-face -face contact essentially between faculty and students. And that's what we implemented. We then within a few days before the governor's order actually sent all our, basically all of our employees home and we told them to work remotely during this time because we felt again that that made the most sense in trying to mitigate the impact of the epidemic on the campus. And again, that I think proved to be effective because we ended up with very few cases actually uh, on campus or those have been treated to campus. So we're still in that same state right now. Um, we've completed our semester uh, remotely. We did a virtual graduation as well. Um, it's had a couple hundred thousand views, uh, nearly a couple hundred thousand views, um, but obviously there's no substitute for the real thing and we'll, we'll do a real one for the class of 2020 uh, at, in 2021, I hope. Um, but we, we've adjusted and we've adapted and we've tried to deliver the content in the way we can. We've had to hold up some of our important research uh, we just got the order from the governor lifting some of the restrictions on our research on campus. So we'll be easing that back in. And that's going to be a good model for us on what we do in fall. So we're excited about that. But that incredible research we've talked about has been slowed down a little bit by this and slowed down some projects and some work. And we hope to catch that up again, but that will take a little bit to get back to. Um, so that's kind of where the university stands at this time. Um, but the financial impacts of this has been pretty significant. Um, we took a hit in a number of areas. We took a hit in the necess necessity to refund our dining and resident halls dollars um, to individuals. We took a hit in terms of reduction in study abroad programs, some reduction in our summer uh, programs as well. We had to cancel summer on campus uh, things. Um, we had some reductions in athletics because we didn't play an NCAA tournament, which would have brought in revenue to the university and our athletics department. And all in all, those things add up to about 50 to $60 million 
uh, in decreased uh, revenue for this budget period or increased expenditures for this budget period. That increased expenditure is important because a lot of that increased expenditure was associated with moving to online uh, education. So there were actually some additional costs for us to move online in terms of licenses, uh, in terms of providing uh, AV equipment for faculty, in terms of getting more people on, helping faculty teach online. All of these things ended up with actually increased costs for us to go online as opposed to doing our in-person teaching. So the financial impact, um, as I said before, for this fiscal year, $50 million, roughly 50 to $60 million, so very significant. Um, next year is where we're really concerned about. Um, because our, our revenue comes mainly from, from three things. One is the research that Wendy talked about. We get indirect costs on some of that money. So that's a source that we hope will generally continue. But we also get a state allocation, and that's very important to us. It's around $300 million every year. And that state allocation really uh, helps cover some of our programs like extension and provides support for our students and helps us keep tuition low at Michigan State University, particularly for in-state students. And that's really what the state allocation does. So we know what's happening with the state budget. We've already seen the revenue estimates, which are significant, more than $3 billion decline in this year's uh, fiscal year for the, for the state, and projected more than $4 million potentially in next year for the state in terms of declining revenue. So we're concerned about what our state allocation will be going forward, and we're estimating there could be significant percentage cuts in state allocation uh, as we look at the next fiscal year. At the same time, our tuition revenue has been put under pressure as well, and that's particularly for our international students. We have a robust group of international students at Michigan State University. They're great students, do great things on campus. They represent about 11% of our students on campus, but about 18% of our tuition revenue. And unfortunately, due to both the epidemic, as well as no visas being issued for international students at this point in time, for anybody at this point in time, basically overseas to travel to the United States, um, we're not sure what's going to happen with our first year class. We have about a 36% decline uh, in enrollment in our first year class and deposits for our first year class from international students compared to what we had last year. And that may be an underestimate of the ultimate uh, cut on that. And so that's very significant for us. And there will be students who want to continue it at Michigan State University, but may not be able to because they can't get back to the country and may not want to do online to continue their education. And that will be difficult for us as well. So we're estimating as much as $90 million in reduced revenue associated with enrollment issues. And that's assuming we do okay in terms of in-state and domestic out-of-state residents, which we'll have to see going forward. So that's a tremendous uh, impact on us. Um, we're adjusting, we're making cost reductions to units. We've done a, performed a hiring freeze at the university. Um, we're looking at salary reductions. We've done that already for the executives at Michigan State University have taken salary reductions ranging from about three to 10%. Um, we're looking at faculty and staff reductions. We've been negotiating with our represented employees, um, both furloughs for some of them, where that makes sense, uh, particularly given the benefits that are available this time uh, for individuals. Uh, or um, we're negotiating salary reductions for those groups as well and taking a look at things like our benefits as well. So all of this is sacrificed essentially for people in Michigan State. And I couldn't be prouder of how people have responded. People have talked about the need to try and preserve jobs by taking potential uh, salary cuts in this tough time. Uh, and they've risen to the occasion when it came to teaching online as well. So I'm very proud of our faculty and staff, uh, support staff and how they responded to this. But we face challenges ahead. And the last thing I'll talk about is reopening in the fall. And that's something we've talked a lot about. And I think I continue to monitor very carefully, of course, what's happening in the state of Michigan uh, in terms of cases of COVID-19 and the progress we're making. And we have been making significant progress. So if you look at the state as a whole and you look at Ingham County and the region around Lansing, um, great work has been done uh, in people uh, staying, sheltering in place, uh, practicing social distancing, we've seen a significant fall in the number of new cases and a reduction in deaths and a reduction in hospital use. And we did not see the kind of surge in cases that we were concerned about in the mid-Michigan region that could have been devastating. Again, that's everybody's hard work and sheltering in place and the work that was done there. Um, so I think if we continue, even with some gradual loosenings in that area, I think we feel that we definitely can bring students back uh, to campus in the fall. With social distancing, with hygiene, uh, with mask wearing on campus, we think a number of these things could be part of the return to campus. Uh, and of course, contact tracing and the ability to test students will be important. And some forms of surveillance for students and faculty and staff as well. Um, we still will have a number of things that we believe that will be hybrid or taught primarily online. Some of the large classes we have wouldn't make sense with students. A large number of students packed into a small area that doesn't make sense. So some of those courses we think would be better taught 
uh, online and remotely. Um, but there'll be other courses and other things like laboratories, music performance, theater arts, where we will want to be able to bring people back for in-person instruction. And we'll have to see what the mix is between those two things as we go forward. Um, so we're, we're excited about trying to do this. We recognize there's a number of challenges and we recognize that bringing these students back um, also creates both opportunities and challenges in the community. So I'll be looking forward to hearing what people have to say about that. Um, but as I said before, Michigan State University uh, is amazing in terms of the resilience of the people here, their ability to pull together and work. So I think we're a campus that can make this work. If things change in the public health arena, if there is a surge or a growth in the epidemic, we're able to adjust and we will adjust again to going primarily online if we need to. Um, but we've heard a lot from our students. We've heard from many faculty and staff on their desire to return to the extent we can um, to doing, again, under very controlled situations, uh, in-person instruction. So we'll be trying to achieve that uh, in the fall. So why don't I stop there, Wendy, and then I'm happy to answer questions about that or anything else you want to talk about uh, about Michigan State University. No, no topics off subject as far as I'm concerned. Sure, you talked a little bit about uh, the move to remote instruction and that you'll be looking at potentially a, a blended approach uh, depending on the needs of the curriculum and the risks of the uh, uh, facilities. What about other aspects of reopening? Uh, like what criteria need to be established to reopen the dormitories uh, specifically? And then of course, uh, we can talk about uh, sporting events um, and, and, and other things, yeah. So, so obviously, you know, we're going to be guided by the public health dictates right now of the state and, and what the state has in place in terms of their orders and so on. Um, I think dorms can be managed, um, but they were, they're going to require, again, changes in behavior people's behavior. So they're going to require you know, things like more frequent cleaning. They're going to require, as I talked about, when you're not in your dorm room, probably the wearing of masks on campus to reduce risk. It's about changing how we deliver food in the dining facilities. That's probably one of the highest risk areas or dining facilities where students congregate. So practicing social distancing there, as well as having many more delivery options for students, essentially call and pick up options for students. So they spend less time in line and can call. We're exploring all these, and I think we will implement a number of these to go forward to try and reduce the risk. And the other thing then is people being responsible about reporting their health to us and, and making sure that people understand that it's very important that if they develop symptoms, we know about it so we can go ahead and test uh, and then test others as well. There will be cases that take place on campus if we do this. I, we're, we're not going to get to a point where there's zero cases as long as there's cases in the community and people coming from outside. The question is how well we can manage it and how we try to make sure that it doesn't become a source of something leaking to the community. Yeah. That's so the so what would you say to a, a family who um, believes that their uh, child is probably safe enough in an MSU dorm, but isn't so sure about the risk of them then returning home to, to their families? I, I think that's a big challenge. I think, uh, you know, I don't have an easy answer to that question. I think, you know, we want people to be aware of this. We're going to be very careful, again, um, to do testing when it's necessary so we understand where outbreaks are and where people might be infected. Um, and, and we're going to limit, we're going to try and limit in terms of holidays, the number of opportunities for people to go back and encourage people to stay on campus um, during this time. Um, but it is a risk that people have to take into account. Thank you. And sporting events. Uh, people are worried if they have uh, se season tickets. Um, so what, what do you think their criteria are, um, either based on the, the state guideline or MSU's own guideline to reopening something like Spartan Stadium? So this is a very you know, national kind of discussion that's taking place. And I think we're, we're paying a lot of attention to what's happening in the major uh, in, the, in the professional league. So for example, what is the NFL contemplating uh, when they talk about a return? What does that look like? What is the NBA thinking about? And so some, we can get some guidance, I think, from some of those organizations. And then the NCAA obviously will have some say in what happens. And again, the Big Ten Conference is really leading the thinking from our group of schools on what, on what we might do or not do. So all of that is to say that um, we believe that there are ways in which through testing again, so testing is important to all of this, that there are ways through testing that we might be able to have football competition um, this year. Um, I don't know whether we could have people in the stands in those competitions. And I think that's more challenging. So could you through social distancing, could you through very careful control of entry, um, where keep, people don't have to walk over each other in the aisles, whatever it is, could you envision a scenario where we could have some fans in the stadium or do, would you envision something more that where, again, our student athletes would be competing uh, without fans, essentially. We still have to protect coaches, staff members, 
trainers, all these people. So there's a lot of things to figure out and work out. Um, but I think it probably is possible. There's a risk, obviously, often from playing these sports as well. And again, in this young population, that risk, you know, for COVID-19, as, as you've implied, is lower than it is for others. Um, but we still need to understand, you know, what we're doing in this and to make sure, again, that we're doing things that we res be public responsible in terms of public health. So, mm -hmm. so I think it is possible. I've thought a lot about this, and I think it is possible. But it also requires, again, that we have some capacity for testing, for rapid testing, and that we recognize that, you know, there'll be times when you might have, you know, five or six people, you know, in a 14-day quarantine because somebody's tested positive on the team. So that could happen. So you have to think about your rosters and think about what you do and so on. Things are a little, you know, different from my pay grade, but I think those are things that'll have to go into this thinking. <laughs> Well, well, actually, I'm curious about your leadership role in the Big Ten and discussing some of these um, issues. Given your background, you'd have a lot to offer. So wh what is your message to the other Big Ten uh, universities about this? I think the message has been, you know, it's evolved a little bit, but I think the message has primarily been, again, about safety uh, and trying to do things in, in the safest way we can. Um, but recognizing that, you know, we're not going to be able to get to zero risk. Um, you, you're not, any, anything we do short of keeping everybody home and keeping everybody in the, in the world basically inside their homes is really the only way to achieve zero risk. So we've already willing to accept some risk for those people who are working in grocery stores, for those people who are first responders. So the question then becomes what level of risk are we able, really willing to accept beyond that? And who are the people who really we should allow to take a risk? Or who are the people where we should really do everything we can to keep them? from taking those kinds of risks. So I think with those kind of things in the background, I think you can start to figure out some things that might be doable and some things that are, that are less achievable. And I think that the challenges are, and this is where I'd love to hear again from, from my colleagues here, um, you know, who are running companies as well is, you know, there's issues around liability, issues around, you know, what, what happens if you have someone whose job normally would require contact with people who doesn't want to do that job anymore? What are some of the options people are looking at to doing that? Because I think these are all things that we're thinking about and returning as well to work. So I'd love to hear what other people think about some of these issues because they're not unique to Michigan State University. Um, I think all of us, I've, I've been on the Michigan Economic Recovery Council um, that's been talking, you know, helping to advise the governor to some degree on, you know, some of these issues around opening and, and you know, opening manufacturing, opening, uh, again, research, for example, in higher education. Um, and, and I think these are really tough discussions. So I'd be interested in understanding what, what other people think. Sure. Um, well, if, if Sparty Stadium does reopen, I have a very important question. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about that personal responsibility that comes with COVID and Rumor is there's a nationally prominent MSU employee who's not worn a mask to date. Uh, he's in shape, really muscular, so maybe he thinks he's invincible. Uh, so what do you think, President Stanley? Should uh, Sparty wear a mask? Um, I think should, Sparty should wear a mask, actually. Yes, okay. I think when we come back, I think, I think people should. I, I, I have a Spartan mask. It's not in front of me right now, but I actually have a, a Spartan mask that somebody made for me, a Spartan cloth mask. So I would say Sparty should, should wear one for sure. Great role, great role model. Um, well, so we have a, a couple um, um, medical questions. So given your background, I mean, what is your, um, well, first, maybe you could tell a little, a little bit more about how this is different than the flu and what it means and we're balancing uh, risk and reward. Um, and, you know, is it your, God, is it your opinion that we've, um, over responded, under responded, you know, been, been just right, knowing that hindsight's 2020? Yeah. Well, I, it, it's a great question. And uh, first of all, as I said before, this is a, a very um, significant, very serious uh, disease and a very serious pathogen. And, um, you know, the number of deaths we've seen are pretty extraordinary. And there's weeks when this has been the number one cause of death in the United States. So it's been higher than heart disease, higher than cancer, which are normally the two leaders. And so it really is a very significant disease and I would not minimize it in any way, shape or form. As I said, what makes it particularly 
interesting is the spectrum of disease because we've had young people who most of whom appear to be asymptomatic, many of whom are infected and don't even know it. Uh, and yet at the extremes of AIDS, mortality can be extraordinarily high. And you can see 20% mortality in people over 80, for example. And when people have coexisting comorbidities, as we call them, like heart disease, obesity, diabetes, uh, again, those numbers go up for people younger than that as well. So this is a very severe disease and much more severe than the flu. The flu, uh, you know, is the flu that's circulating currently, not 1918 back in the past, but the flu that's circulating currently is a much milder illness overall. Yes, there are some deaths that, are, that take place, again, at the ages, at the extreme of ages, but in this disease, we see many more deaths, I think, proportionally for the number of people infected, at least based on the number of people we've been able, able to identify as infected so far. So it, it's a very severe disease. Um, the response, you know, I, I, I could go on on this and we could, we could take an entire program about it. Um, and, and as you said, Wendy, so accurately, hindsight is twenty twenty. So would there some things I would have done differently? Yes. Um, I think if you were able to get back some recordings I had with family members or, or colleagues, you could hear some things where I said, oh, I think I, you've got to do this. Um, for example, I'll give an example. When people came back from infected areas, um, I would have made it mandatory. I'm not recommended that they go into a 14 day quarantine. Now, how you would have enforced that is another question, right? So I, 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 it's easy for me to say without being, you know, the head of the Massachusetts State Department of Health or the New York State Department of Health, how you would have enforced that is more challenging. But that was really a requirement. Um, I think if you look at what happened in the epidemic, it really was when people started coming back from Europe, from the East Coast, from China, from the West Coast, they really that's when the epidemic started. And it was travelers returning there, of course, were the main source. And I think if you'd been more aggressive about that early on, we might have, I don't think we would have eliminated the epidemic. I don't think it would have been perfect. But we might have dampened it down. So here, we might have been in a much better place now than we would be at this point in time. We are at this point in time. And then I think that, you know, I recognize there's a tremendous economic impact from this. I've talked about the economic impact on Michigan State University. It's extraordinary. People's livelihoods uh, are at stake. And so there's every reason to try and get back. But I think you have to strike that balance with trying to get back safely and mitigating the worst effects, which is, where, as, we've as people have talked about, where you overwhelm your health system, where you get so you don't have enough uh, ICU beds, you don't have enough ventilators, you don't have enough personnel to, to take care of people in the hospital. And you know, my family, I, I think some of you may be aware, both of my daughters are MDs, one is an emergency room physician, one is a, a medical resident. Both of them have been taking care of in contacting COVID-19 patients. And then my wife, Ellen, who's also an MD, PhD, um, has been working, did some work on the COVID-19 floor at Stony Brook University Hospital. So, so you know, I know, you know, that this can really take off. It took off in New York. It's taking off in Boston. Uh, it took off in Detroit. So we really want to avoid that from happening. So I think that's why the kind of things we continue to do and emphasizing the social distancing and emphasizing personal responsibility remains very important. If I can make one more point really quickly. Um, I'm really, I'm pretty optimistic about the possibility of vaccine or good drugs for this. Um, I believe we are going to achieve it. Um, I don't know how good a vaccine we'll get, whether it'll be as good as a measles vaccine or whether it'll be more like a flu vaccine where you get some protection but not complete protection or measles where everybody who gets it basically is protected against disease. I don't know how that's going to work out, but I think we will develop a vaccine um, and I hope it comes sooner rather than later. I know there's some progress being made and major push on it, but you know, wishing doesn't make it true. We have to just go through the science and see what works. And then I am excited that we'll develop some good antivirals as well. If you look at HIV infection, right? HIV ravaged the US you know, 40 years ago. Um, it was a devastating epidemic. Um, we've controlled HIV in the United States now. We haven't eliminated it, but we've controlled it through really good drug therapies. There's no vaccine to present, prevent HIV and AIDS, but there is good drug therapy that really turns it into a chronic illness that really can be completely under control. I don't see the same thing for COVID necessarily, but I see us developing much better antivirals that would reduce the chance of people dying from this disease and change the severity of the disease. So those are two things I'm relatively optimistic about. Um, if the U.S. and the world works on this, I have a lot of confidence in scientists to develop some things that will help us. That's, that's good to know. It really is uh, very much a relief to hear that. Um, it still could be a, a while um, away. I, I saw um, I saw the governor released a you know a six a six phase plan um, and phase six was basically post vaccine and it was actually phase five that um, 
suggested in-person education and, and other in-person in events. And I think when it was released, we are at phase three. So it, it feels far away. Um, you know, and for us, I mean, we're very fortunate. Our business, we, we can work remote, but some things are less effective. I imagine you're in the same situation. You know, is, is it a gray area to do more remote instruction? Do you feel like educational outcomes are being compromised? That, I, I think, um, yeah, it's a great question. Again, but yeah, I think the data is, you know, not out on that. I think anecdotally, our students would say that for some of them, it's really not a good substitute. Others, I think, thrive uh, remotely and certainly mm -hmm good online uh, education, I think, do well. Um, and I think there's certain courses that lend itself to it. I, I, I think I would have looked forward to a statistics course that was online because I think that's something where you can le re learn, get feedback, do problems, watch all the lectures in a row, learn the concepts. I think, it, I, think I would have enjoyed it. Um, other courses, my Western Civilization courses, my humanities courses, I don't think online would have substituted for the in-person discussions we had and, and as we really explored ideas. And so I think, I think we really want to do both. And if you look at things like music, for example, or creative arts, um, it's very difficult to do those things online. It's really not the same as you're trying to show someone, you know, a horn player, for example, you know, it's very difficult to do that remotely um, as you're trying to show someone how to do something. So I think all those things, you know, are, are, are better done um, through in-person learning. Um, but again, you know, how do you do them safely? And, and I think that's important. So that continues to be kind of the rub. Um, so no, if we had to go completely online, I think we can still deliver um, great content for our students. It's Michigan State content. I think people forget sometimes it's the same faculty. These mm -hmm. are the state faculty. One of the reasons you're coming to Michigan State, of course, it's a beautiful campus. There's incredible things going on, but it's really Michigan State faculty. And at the end of the time, it's a Michigan State degree. So, you know, both those things really matter. Um, but um, as I said before, if we have the opportunity to bring some students back and we think we can do it, uh, we want to try and give them that opportunity. I think the, the students want to come back. Um, but you're right. I think, you know, the issue becomes more about faculty and staff and about families. Mm -hmm. So this might be a little bit of a, um, a unfair question, but um, if a lot of learning can take place uh, re remotely, at least for a lot, a lot of students and a lot of subjects, what, what is the, the worst case scenario for MSU here? So, so say a vaccine is, is delayed. Um, or there's a, just just an increased, um, you know, that, that risk reward uh, balance seems more risky, and you're just not able to return to normal or close to normal. Uh, what would happen to to MSU, and how how much time do you have before you would see that happen? Well, I think it it, it could happen relatively quickly. I think if you had a major viral surge um, while you were welcoming students back, and there was a, a major epidemic in in the surrounding area, for example, that would be problematic and, and how you respond to that. I think we're thinking about those things as we talk about opening. That's what we call plan B. Um, if something like that were to happen, how would we manage it? Manage it? And we're having conversations with the hospitals in the area to understand kind of what capacity is. I think it's just a way of being responsible as someone who's you know one of the major employers, but also someone who also lends, leads to increased population within the region. Um, I think if we have to go completely online, again, probably have students who don't want to continue. Uh, during that time would rather take some time off and do other things during that time. So I think you'll see a reduction in the number of students in Michigan State University. And I think, again, the quality overall for those who go will be, uh, you know, diminished because people really do care about the social components uh, of, the, of the educational experience and the chance to meet new people uh, and experience that opportunity to really be in a new location and meet new people. So I think that's an important part of, of what we do. Um, and the financial implications, you know, would be related to what happens to enrollment uh, and also what happens to those ancillary things like football, dining, and housing. So all of those lead to kind of the upper end of our uh, idea of what our budget could look like. So we factored that in as we think about our budget. But that would be, that would get to core programs at the university if we see that kind of uh, diminish, diminished uh, enrollment. This, we, you know, if we have to go completely online again, I think you'd probably see some, some reduction in programs associated with that too. And we'd like mm -hmm. to avoid that if we can. So I, I just have two, two more questions. One relates to your ability to um, influence the behavior of individual students. Um, 
I, I wonder if that was a factor in your plan or your ability to reopen. Um, I know, you know, there are concerns of, of Lansing residents of seeing MSU students in Greek homes, you know, socializing in big numbers with, without masks. So, so how much do you feel you are able to get the message across to students about what safe behavior looks like and what kinds of um, expectations are you able to set or communicate? So it's really got to be, you know, peer driven to a large degree. I, I think I can I can send emails and, and tell people this is how I expect them to behave. But I think it's got to be peer driven. And I think we have to have parents involved in that conversation, too. I think it'll be important as we communicate with students going forward um, that we're communicating both with students, but hopefully with their parents as well about what we expect from people, that it will be different on campus this fall. When open up it will be different and that people's behaviors have to be different and I think you know peer pressure does work um, I think it really makes a difference I think if you look at smoking on campus now I, you know as I walk around MSU I rarely see anybody smoking on campus um, and that's a peer pressure issue we're not arresting people who break the rules it's that everybody understands that's not acceptable behavior uh, at Michigan State University anymore so I think we do have the opportunity particularly on campus to do it it's more challenging when people get off campus, um, I'll, I'll agree to that. It's more difficult for us to do. But again, if we look at things like the you know, fraternities and sororities and their ability to take advantage of funding from the university or connections with the university, um, you know, we have some levers we can use um, for them. And again, our ex we'll have high expectations for what people should be doing. Um, people will, will break some of those rules. Um, they always do. Um, and we'll try to make sure that there are consequences, you know, reasonable consequences associated with that in terms of people's behavior. And we'll, we'll again, but we'll be really transparent about this. Um, you know, we'll talk about what we expect and how we expect to deal with issues where people are not. Um, but I think it, it won't be a police state. That's not going to work. It's really got to be buying into shared values, essentially, that people believe that in order to make, be open, in order to be safe, in order to help protect your families, we want to reduce the risk of you and others getting infected, and these are the ways in which we'll do it. It's really got to be about that overall. Mm -hmm. Let me end um, by uh, observing that MSU has, I, I think, three three medical colleges, uh, clinical services, uh, past history, and really robust uh, life sciences uh, re research, and plus your expertise and capabilities. So I'm curious, uh, what role do you see for MSU in terms of potentially being a leader um, in mobi mobilizing COVID uh, solutions going forward? So great question. And, and uh, I think we're, we're already, of course, you know, doing some of those things. So as you know, um, Nigel Panath, who's uh, one of our faculty members, has really been one of the leaders uh, in assembling data and promoting the use of convalescent serum um, from individuals who've survived COVID-19 infection, taking their blood, which contains antibodies, things that help protect against viral infection, we believe, uh, and then taking that, that serum and injecting it uh, into either people who are suffering from COVID-19 infection currently, or as a prophylaxis for people who may be at high risk for COVID-19 disease, either on the front lines or have other immune conditions that might put them at higher risk, and seeing whether this can a, protect against infection in the case of prophylaxis, or B, uh, help, uh, help treat people um, who have COVID-19 disease. The passive, we call this passive immunization is another term for it. So it's not a vaccination, but it's a passive immunization. You're giving somebody else's uh, antibodies to someone to help protect them. And this has already been tested now. It's in a phase one study and was found to be safe, which we kind of knew it was from other uh, diseases it's been tried for. We knew it was safe, but that was nice to determine. And now we'll be looking at phase two and three to understand whether it really does make a difference and help protect people from disease. So that's one area with Nigel's leadership that I think we're taking a lead. The second area is in diagnostic testing. Um, we have a couple of uh, uh, scientists on campus who develop tests they believe are better than the existing PCR tests um, to detect virus, can detect lower copies, lower virus copy numbers than other current tests that are available, fewer false negatives. One of the problems with the current test is a false negative. So in other words, you test somebody, the test comes back later, test them a day later, they're positive for COVID-19, raising the question that they probably had an in, in an er erroneous uh, test because the test just may not be sensitive enough to detect infection at low levels. And so that's important if we have that. If we could actually get that approved by the FDA, that might be a tool we could use internally to do some of our own testing and would have some advantages. So we're pushing that, um, but that's a, a second thing. And then the third thing we've been really interested in 
has been ways in which we can make personal protective equipment go farther. I've talked a lot about masks being used on campus. These will be the kind of cloth masks you really, which are, are good at keeping you from spreading to other people. Um, mm -hmm. Not the N95 masks that are good to keeping you from getting infected from other people. Mm -hmm. um, but those N95 masks are still in short supply. And we've pioneered some ways to decontaminate them, two different ways mm -hmm. that again could help spread them out. So one mask could go for 10 or 20 uses as opposed to one. And that would be like having you know 19 more mass per mass for each one that we can do that for. So those are the kind of things I think we're looking at. Uh, and I hope we'll be at the forefront as people think about, again, new and novel things. We've got some great scientists. I think there's going to be funding available from NIH and other agencies for COVID-19 research, that's for sure. And I think uh, we could probably make some major contributions. Even people who haven't been working in that area to begin with, um, I think we'll make some major contributions if they can get the opportunity to participate. Wow, that's very exciting to hear. I actually hadn't realized how much MSU was, was already doing in the field. Um, well, I'm going to end with that. I think we've uh, answered all the questions. I really appreciate your time and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, goodbye, everyone, and look forward uh, to seeing you on additional uh, Investor Roundtable sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much.